spring of 1943, the Ruhr is very, very heavily damaged. Then comes um, the Dam's Raid, which we know all about, um, very big booster for morale. And then finally in 1943, the Battle of Hamburg. I never wrote a book about the Battle of the Ruhr. I did about the Battle of Hamburg. Four raids on Hamburg. The second one produced a dreadful firestorm. If you read a book which says the RAF sent a, a firestorm raid to Hamburg, throw, don't throw the rest of the book away because it's rubbish. The man doesn't know what he's talking about. The raid that caused the firestorm was an absolute routine raid in regard its bomb loads. It just happened to be very concentrated, it was very hot, it was very dry, and buildings started burning very readily, joined together into fire areas, small fire areas formed bigger fire areas, and then a huge wave of wind is drawn in to make the fires burn. Very hard luck on the people of Hamburg, 40,000 of whom died, um, mostly through carbon monoxide in their shelters. But the important thing for us coming up to Nuremberg is that a device called window, sometimes now known as chaff, was used for the first time. And that destroyed the efficacy of the German coastal defences. Again, I'm going to talk about that later. So, window and Hamburg. The Ruhr and... What was the other one? Obo. <laughs> the little one I've been talking about, the beams. Obo. Mm, I'm sorry, you're talking to an 82-year-old man who shouldn't be here. He should be back home in his rocking chair. <laughs> it's, it's true. Come on, somebody knows the name. Obo. Obo. Obo, yes, right. So, 1943 has been pretty successful until the autumn of 1943 when the big one comes up, Berlin. The longer nights enable uh, them to reach into Germany. Where's Berlin? Right up here. And um, he raged 16 times to Berlin and about a dozen times to other targets. But things are starting to go wrong. The Luftwaffe is beginning to recover from the setback of Oboe. No, <laughs> of window. Uh, and navigation to Berlin is very, very difficult. Navigation to Hamburg was brilliant because of these little peninsulas. The aircraft were coming across the North Sea and the radar operator with H2S, there's another one. H2S is the ground scanning radar in each aircraft. Nothing, no worry about the curvature of the earth because you're carrying it along your own radar sta uh, station all the time, tucked underway under the belly of the bomber. Right, I think I better go back and look at my routes. Next up, Berlin. Berlin is um, a disappointment. Losses getting heavier and heavier. Bombing results never concentrated. Berlin, modern city, big wide streets. Fire does not join as easily. Berliners, tough people, Prussian type of people, they don't collapse. Um, and the Losses are getting so severe in Bomber Command that the Sterling has to be taken out of the um, main force. The older Halifaxes have to be taken out of the main force. So from now onwards, it's going to be Lancasters and the Halifax that's going to have to bear the brunt of what's coming up. Um, I've got a plot here which I thought was going to be distributed, um, but it hasn't been, so... Uh, but it shows and I can't enlarge it in any way, how even as late as March 1944, just before Nuremberg, um, a whole a bomb plot, these are little dots, a bomber when it's flying along 20,000 feet, bomb bay is open, bomb aimer says, bomb's gone, 
uh, a little camera in the on bay starts ticking over and 60 seconds later a big floating flash, a strip of four. And if there is no cloud, it'll tell the people in, on, back at home uh, exactly where your bombs have dropped. And these two plots show how the whole of Bomber Command can miss Berlin or Stuttgart. I'm sorry, but um, I did think that these were going to be uh, distributed and left on your seats, but they're not. Just take it from me that Bomber Command can sometimes, even on the eve of the, Berlin, of the, Norm, of the Nuremberg Raid, can miss by huge margins. And at the same time, they are losing more and more bombers on nearly every raid. Um, so we'll go back to, well, we'll go on to the um, decision to raid Nuremberg. 9.30 on the morning of March 30th. It has been decided that Bomber Command from April the 1st is going to be subordinated to preparing for the um, invasion. So Harris's freedom of action is now down to the wire. He's got tonight and the next night and then it's finished. It is a half moon night which is not normally um, the time when Bomber Command would operate. But um, the meeting takes place, the meeting that takes place every morning at the underground bunker, which is Bomber Command headquarters. Harris comes down from his office, everybody's waiting for him. The first thing they get is the Met report. Now I have to tell you there are two things that I want to stress most carefully. One is that the meteorological situation on this night is of absolute paramount importance to what happens. The second thing I'll tell you later. What is happening Met-wise? Mr. Spence, who lives not far from where I lived in Lincolnshire, and I went to see him a couple of times. He was uh, Bomber Command's Met man. He'd been in touch with the central meteorological place at Dunstable, and he'd produced a forecast which says there's a lot of bad weather coming down the North Sea from Norway. Uh, anything in North Germany is in danger of running into that and getting iced up. So North Germany is out. South Germany, South and Central Germany, Germany goes right down to here, what you have got somewhere roughly in this area is the remains of a cold front at high level. Uh, cloud at high level, which can be made use of to hide the bombers on their approach flight. Um, so those are the two things. Oh, also down here in South Germany is a very dense um, depression with very thick cloud, but it is moving steadily away. And it is believed that it'll be down to about here by the time the bombers get to this area. So Harris does, first of all, he has to have a look at the Air Minister's latest directive, um, listing six targets, all connected with the aero engine, the, with the aircraft industry and the ball bearing industry. And these are what he's supposed to be bombing as a priority. Harris has never really taken all this very seriously. And the people above him, Air, Air Marshal Portal, head of the RAF, um, and his headquarters have never insisted, partly because Harris lives not too far from Churchill. And Churchill and Harris, Churchill loves the idea of bashing the Germans about in a big way. So they form a sort of duumvirate um, of two people who are basically running the bomber offensive. And the people who should be running it from the air ministry aren't. That's a simplification, but that's basically the way it was. So Harris then says, well, we're going to probably operate in this area. What have we got? So they get the um, target priority list out. That's why the ME-109 is often called a BF-109, Bayerische Fuchsreutwerke. I'm only showing the German off. I'm not a modest man. <laughs> um, and the other one is Schweinfurt. 
home of the German uh, uh, ball bearing industry. But Harris really didn't want smaller towns like this. He wants to go out on a big target that has not been seriously attacked, and he wants to go out on a target that's got uh, kudos, that is means something to everybody. The pre-war German Nazi rallies were held at Nuremberg. And there's Nuremberg, halfway between two of his priority targets. He said, right, that's the target for tonight. And they have a very quick uh, talk about how they're going to get there and back. But within a few minutes, he's off. He's gone upstairs to his office and he leaves it to his staff to put all the details in. And this is all run by a man called Sornby, Air Marshal Sornby, one rank lower than Harris, is the Deputy Commander-in-Chief. He runs the planning team. And the first thing they've got to do is decide a route. And this route is the one that they decide they're going to have. Using the high cloud that is believed to be in this area to um, uh, cover the bombers on a long straight route uh, it's a very direct route and hoping that the cloud has retreated south from Nuremberg leaving it clear because if you've got no cloud then your visual markers can find the target the target aiming point is in the middle of the city it didn't over any of the war factories there are very important war factors in, in Nuremberg but it is area bombing hit the middle of the city as much as you can. Um, so that's how it was left at the end of the morning. Two disputes take place during the day. No, two important points. One dispute. The bomber group commanders have a joint conversation with Bomber Command HQ, which is somewhere out here. And Bennett of 8 Group doesn't like the route. He doesn't like this long straight route into uh, the target. It gives the Germans too much of a chance to catch the bomber stream. So he objects to it and they have a conference on the phone. One and five groups, that's where I lived, Boston and Lincolnshire. At that time, I was there. So um, that's not important. Um, these are the all Lancaster groups. They are quite happy with the group, with the um, the route. They are the more durable aircraft, the more reliable aircraft. Halifax people are not really very happy with it because their aircraft steadily suffering more and more losses compared with the Lancasters. It's all a question of height. Lancaster can buy that high a maximum Halifax down here. That's the maximum they can get. And the fighters go for the lower flying aircraft. You'll hear more about that later. Anyway, they have a conference on the telephone. Um, eight group doesn't like it, but enough of the other groups decide that um, they're quite happy with the straight in, straight out route. A following wind will help them through here. This high cloud uh, has been forecast for here, and that should be all right. But still, they send off a mosquito from the meteorological flight to have a look at the weather. Ba -ba -da -ba -dum. Done all that. Da -ba -da -ba -dum. Dum. Yeah. And this mosquito takes off in the early afternoon and either doesn't fly to Nuremberg and back. It's not as obvious that. He sort of flies a circular thing where he can see it's been told to look in the direction of Nuremberg. And he finds that the cloud is still covering the target and he finds that there is no high cloud to cover the approach. The navigator, a Canadian, Flight Lieutenant R.G. Dale, used to be one of my regular correspondents. All this work was done 40 years ago, by the way. That map is 40 years old. And he runs straight to the control tower, gets a telephone link straight through to Bomber Command Headquarters and reports Nuremberg may be covered with cloud and the bombers aren't going to get any help from cloud on the outward route. Sornby, with whom I was in touch and who helped me, 
Harris having not replied to my letter saying would he help me, uh, describe what happens next. They issue a new forecast and um, he takes it into his boss's office. Here you are, sir, this is the latest uh, forecast. And he waits. And what he's waiting for is what he thinks is the inevitable cancellation of the raid. These are very, very dangerous conditions to send Bomber Command in. Half moon, uh, long straight route, um, clear night, um, prospects of bombing in the target, dodgy, but nothing happens. Harris does not cancel the raid. I can jump forward to ooh, six, seven years later when I wrote a book called The Battle of Hamburg, now called Firestorm Hamburg, uh, in which Harris did decide that I could um, go and see him, so I went to see him in his home. You don't interview a man like Harris, you sit and listen to his, um, his uh, oft-repeated tirade as to how Bomber Command wasn't properly looked after, how he was badly supported, etc., etc., and uh, because he wasn't honoured immediately after the war like everybody else was. But eventually I got round to asking my questions about Hamburg, and then I finished and I said, may I go back to Nuremberg and ask you, and I told him about Saul B and the weather report, and I said, um, was there a reason why you didn't cancel the raid on Nuremberg? Because this is Harris's first night, worst night of the war. And he said, um, I, I've no recollection of the, of the event at all. So I said, well, if I send you a copy of the book, this book, with the page marked, would you have a look at it and then reply, yes, certainly, Mr. Middlebrook, I'll help you as much as I can. And did I hear from him? No. Uh, so that's the end of that little story. The important part about the Met report is that it was not sent to the RAF stations. It was sent to the group commanders, but it was not sent down to the stations where the briefings were going to take place very shortly. The crews know that there's a big long raid in due because they know the balance between the fuel loads and the bomb loads. And I can give you figures the average Lancaster is going to take seven and a half tons of fuel to deliver four and a half tons of bombs. So they know, the crews know before they go into briefing that it's going to be a long raid. Um, there's a lot of quotes in the book uh, about the anxiety. Uh, there's no mention of the Met update at all, of course. But they do try to help the raid by shortening the bomb uh, time over target, TOT, from something like 22, 23 minutes has been the usual, and they shorten it to 17. That means that the bomber stream is going to be very short, and they've actually measured it. The bomber stream is that big. So it starts out when it's concentrated on the North Sea. Don't worry about these blue things, that's later in the night. Um, the bomber stream runs along like this, all the way, with the pathfinders at the front, with the supporters with them. Supporters are Lancasters drawn from either one or five groups to thicken up the number of aircraft going into a target early, because if it's just the pathfinders, they're going to be very vulnerable to flak, radar-directed flak. Um, so, there's your bomber stream, there's the supporters, and then there's five waves. And the Halifax crews are told that they're going to get a fair share of all the height bands and of all the waves. And that uh, helps a little bit because the Halifax are a very, very windy lot and I don't blame them. I've got a quote here which I think is useful. Um, the briefings take place, I've got here gasps, long leg, Many quotes about anxiety, etc., uh, etc., et and then I have a quotation from a English pilot, Sergeant Blackburn of Twelve Squadron, based at Wickenby in North Lincolnshire, 
so that's part of one group. And he says, our navigator and I had a macabre routine that we followed during nav briefings, nav navigation, briefings. We studied intensely the faces and reactions of the other navigators and bomb aimers in the room. What I have to say is you've got your PNB group, PNB, pilot navigator bomb aimer. They are the important people in a crew. A pilot, because he's the captain of the aircraft and he's got to be pretty skillful to do all the landings, taking it off and everything. Um, bomb aimer, because he's going to be uh, helping the navigator and he's actually the man that's going to drop the bombs. The important man is the navigator. Navigators really decide whether the raid is going to be successful or not. Anyway, this pilot is present at the navigator's briefing. Um, we, we studied intensely the faces and reactions of the other navigators and bomb aimers in the room. Um, predicting which crews would get the chop that night. Sadly, our predictions were astonishingly accurate. Uncertainty and plain, simple terror permeated the stuffy briefing room that time. Those long, long legs into the heartland of Germany just begged for fighter activity. We finally decided that two of our relatively senior crews appeared to be showing the greatest amount of strain and would likely buy it that night. When we got back, we found we had been correct. And I looked up the two crews that had got lost and there were two pilots were flight lieutenants with between them 55 operations. So they're not the new boys getting windy. The new boys are still fairly naive. It's the realists, the veterans, who can see in this plan the seeds of disaster possibly. And uh, identifying from the Nuremberg raid, the two flight lieutenants, I've told you that, all 14 men in the two crews were killed. Mixed crew members, not a Canadian squadron, but two from Toronto, two from Manitoba, one from Regina, and one from the USA, from Kansas. I think it's time we got on with the raid. Takeoffs take place relatively late because it gives the moon um, more chance to get settled down lower and lower towards the horizon. Um, there's no serious problems taking off. There were two aircraft had slight accidents and we've withdrawn um, three, it says here. Uh, but nobody was hurt. And there are 779 four-engine bombers, all Halifaxes and Lancasters, on, safely on the way. Um, you can see the outward route. You can see the individual groups, one and five group, go over a searchlight.